Anyway, welcome back. So we're looking at entering the soul through stories, spirituality and self-understanding through the analogical, the metaphoric, the archetypal, and the poetic. Now, three sessions. Last week we looked at just some reflections on language and uh, two little sample stories. This week I want to divide the, the, the hour this week. Before the coffee break, I want to do some biblical stories. And they're archetypal stories on searching sin and redemption. And then after the coffee break, I just want to do one, which I think is one of the great fairy tales ever told. I'm not sure I can tell it with its, uh, as it should be told. Um, one version of the Firebird story. It's one of the great fairy tales that exist in many cultures. And then next week, I'm going to get to technology. And next week, instead of me telling a story, I'm going to have Michael Mead, who's a famous storyteller and anthropologist, drum and tell you the story. Um, and it's going to be the second version of the Firebird story. Okay, so tonight, we want to look at biblical stories of searching sin and redemption. And I want to begin with the, the very beginning of Scripture and the stories of falling and of original sins. See, we always talk about the word, the original sin. Well, there wasn't just one original sin, there were a series of original sins. What you have at the beginning of Scripture, you have a series of stories. And every one of them uh, kind of begins in the beginning, which means before time is the way it was right now, and it explains how time is now. Now, we have made the most of the Adam and Eve story, but immediately there's another series of stories. Cain and Abel, the Tower of Babel, Noah and the Ark, Lot and his wife. And I, I can't even do them all, but there's just a whole series of stories, and all of them are stories of falling. The story of Lot and his wife. Remember that story? They said uh, God asked them to leave Sodom and Gomorrah, and they were not to look back. And when they got out of the city, Lot's wife turned and looked back, and she turned into a pillar of salt. So a catechetical teacher was teaching this to young grade, second graders, and she said, so Lot's wife turned around, looked back, and turned into a pillar of salt. And one little girl said, that happened to my mom. <laughs> okay. We were driving, and she looked back, and she turned into a cement pillar. Okay. <laughs> okay. Those are archetypal stories. Okay. Let's begin with the first one of the most famous one, the story of Adam and Eve. So I won't read the story, but I'm, I'll, I'll just give the story kind of rote, and then we'll look at it. So they say, God made the first man and woman. And then he made him in his image and likeness, and he put him into a garden. And he put him into the garden, and he said, you name all the animals, and you can do anything in this garden except one thing. At the center of the garden, there'll be a tree the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and you're not to eat the fruit from the tree, and the day you eat the fruit from the tree, you will die. And so he left. So Adam and Eve are living in the garden, and one day a snake comes. And the snake asks Eve to taste the fruit. Eve refuses. He says, God told us the day we eat the fruit, we will die. And the devil said, no, God said that because it's the opposite. The day you taste the fruit, you're going to become like God, and you will know good and evil, and you'll become like God. And Eve looked at the fruit, and it was enticing, and it was good to eat. So she ate some and gave it to Adam, and then immediately their minds were opened. Okay, pardon me, their eyes were opened. Their minds were darkened, which is a very interesting expression. They saw more, they understood less. Their minds were opened. Pardon me, their eyes were opened, but their minds were darkened. And then they noticed they were naked. They hadn't noticed that before. Now they were naked, and they suddenly became ashamed of their nakedness. So they took leaves and tried to cover themselves. And then God came, and they were covering themselves with leaves in the garden. And God asked them if they eat the fruit. He said, why are you hiding? And Adam said, because we're naked. God said, who told you you were naked? Who told that to you? And then God gives them animal skins to cover their nakedness. Interesting little piece of a story. And then God says to them, now because you did this, there's going to be curses. 
and he gives out three curses. He says to the man, because you did this, you will try to till the soil and grow grain, but you'll grow thistles and thorns, and by the sweat of your brow, you will eat. And he told the woman, because you did this, you will need a husband, but he will lord it over you, and you will bear children with pain. And he called the snake in. The snake didn't escape here either. <laughs> because you tempted them, I'm taking your legs off, and from now on you're going to crawl in the, in, in, in the dust. And God leaves them and expels them from the garden, and then salvation history begins from that point. Okay. It's a story of fall, and we call it the fall, the original sin, and so on. Let's unpackage that story. Okay. Now, first of all, a little bit of background to that story. The story itself of the snake, the fruit, and so on, is taken from an older story. That does not uh, scandalize you, but long before the, the, the Adam and Eve story, there was a story of the Numa Elish, the Epic of Gilgamesh in Babylonian literature, and the story in the Babylonian literature goes this. They said, at the beginning, the gods created the human beings, but the gods had eternal life. And they didn't want human beings to have eternal life, so they never leaked them the secret. So the gods lived forever, but human beings died. But as happened in those days, gods and human beings sometimes had affairs. <laughs> okay. So... A goddess, a nymph goddess, fell in love with a human being, Gilgamesh, and she leaked him the secret. And she said, the secret to eternal life lies at the bottom of the ocean. And you need to go to the bottom of the ocean at the end of the world, and there you will find a plant. And it's the plant, the tree of knowledge and good and evil. And if you bring this plant out and eat it, you will live forever. So Gilgamesh goes off to the ends of the earth, dives to the bottom of the ocean, finds the plant, and immediately he knew that this was the secret to eternal life. And he brings it to the shore, and, um, but then he decides he's not going to eat it himself. He's going to take it back so that all the people can eat it, and all the people will live forever. But as he's putting on his clothes, a snake comes out of the, the woods, and the snake eats the, the plant of life. And the snake sheds its skin, and he realizes the snake will live forever, and he has to go back, and he has to die. Now, the sacred author took that story. Now, incidentally, there's a little further than I need to go today in terms of story, but just interestingly. And when you read the Old Testament, Jewish scriptures, it's not written the way it's glued together. You know, Genesis, and they wrote this way. It started with the Exodus, and then they wrote backwards. Jewish religious history really begins with the Exodus, with the great miracle. The same with Christianity. You didn't write the Genesis story, and there was a diary kept of Christ's life. Christ resurrected. Then they wrote backwards, and what about his birth and his life, and then they wrote forwards. The Exodus was the great miracle that forms Judaism. After that miracle, they began to reflect backwards. So that miracle, uh, made, Genesis was written well after the Ten Commandments. And that's important because they're going to be all, all the Ten Commandments are already going to be in one commandment, and that's the apple. See, so it, <clears throat> you're going to see in the, in the Old Testament, that's probably the highest statement of morality is already in that story. So this is the story. God makes the man and woman, and notice how it's different than in Umelish. God gives them eternal life. They don't have to steal it. God wants us to live forever. See, that's already changing the story. The gods, the ancient gods, they didn't want human beings to live forever. Our God wants us to live forever. He gives us eternal life. But he puts a condition, or she, whatever God is. And you're going to see in all the stories you want to tell that there's a, there's a condition. There's always one thing. So he said, you can do anything in this garden except there's one thing. At the center, there's this tree. And from that fruit, you can't eat. The day you eat from the fruit, you will die. Now, ask you a question. Why that condition, and what is the condition? Now, obviously... Um, I want to go back here to the very first thing where we talk about uh, analogical, metaphoric, archetypal. This is the metaphoric, archetypal, analogical image. This is not history, okay? 
Later on, we can take the story, we ask the story, is this tr story true? Not historically, doesn't mean it didn't happen. In fact, if you ask the, the, a good scholar, say, did the Adam and Eve story happen? They say, not the way it's written, but it's true in terms that it was true for the first man and woman, and it's true for every man and woman who ever lived since. It's truer than true. This is, these aren't fairy tales. It's analog. It's, it's archetypal. So, so at the beginning of history, this, this happened. But the key thing is, what is the condition? And why a condition? Okay. Why didn't God just tell them, here you go, just enjoy the earth and be happy forever? Okay. Why did God say, but there's one thing. Um, don't break this one commandment. Why that commandment? Well, this is the first thing. The commandment isn't extrinsic, the commandment is intrinsic, which means God could not not give that commandment. See, an extrinsic commandment works this way. If suppose that the mayor of San Antonio made a law or the city, you're not allowed to comb your hair on Ash Wednesday. Okay, that, that there's no inner reason why you could do that. You could do it extrinsically. See, so God didn't just put some arbitrary condition, which sometimes you have in older spiritual books. And I was still raised that spirituality, they'd say, you know, like, well, he had to give a condition because otherwise you can't go to heaven cheaply, like God had to test our faith and so on. No, don't go there. God isn't laying arbitrary tests. You know, I don't want you to go to heaven cheaply. You know, you've got to earn it and somehow prove it and so on. No. There could not not be a condition. The condition is intrinsic, which means this. And, and, and then you'll see it when, 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 we, when we tease out the metaphor. Um, God made a love-oriented universe, okay? And if you make a love-oriented universe, there are, un there are conditions inside of love that can't be changed, you know? You know, it, can, can you love somebody unconditionally? No, because there are intrinsic conditions inside of love, which means Love has to be received as gift, or it's not love. So for instance, you can offer love to somebody, but if they don't receive it as gift, then it, it ruins it. It doesn't work. See, love has to be received in a certain way. Okay, now, let me try to get the metaphor. It's interesting, the metaphor itself, when you read it, and that's delivered, these are good storytellers, it's somewhat laden with sexual metaphor, with sexual image. So when you read it, the nakedness and so on, so it could cause a, a cheap reader to conclude they, they committed sexual sin or something. No. Remember, they were told to increase and multiply. <laughs> <laughs> Sex for them was a commandment to do it, not to not do it. Okay. <laughs> but the sexual metaphor is deliberate. You know what the metaphor is? It's a metaphor of rape. See, Love has conditions. When you give it, if it's received in gratitude, it becomes life-giving. If it's not received, if it's abusive, it becomes death-dealing and it causes these curses. I'll give you one story. James Mackey, very fine Irish theologian, explaining this. So James Mackey said, I'm going to explain to you what is the opposite of original sin this original sin, and you'll understand what original sin is. It's a personal story from his life. He said, when I was a young man, he said, I went, once went to Africa on a hunting expedition. He said, that was with some, some young men. And we were out in the jungle, and one morning, he said, I got, got up early when they were all still sleeping. And I went out, he said, and I shot two wild turkey. He said, I was quite proud of it. It was the first thing I'd ever shot in my life. I was 19 years old. He said, and I strapped them onto my belt, and I was walking back to the camp, very proud. He had killed these two wild turkey. He said, when I heard some movement in the bush, and I became very frightened because he realized he was being followed. He said, I, what do you do when you're, when you're scared? You grab your gun. He said, so hanging on my gun. He said, but then I realized what it was. He was a young boy. He said, he was maybe 12, naked, bloated belly. He said, he was starving. He said, and I realized immediately what this young boy wanted wasn't me. He wanted the food. He said, so as soon as I saw that, he said, I stopped, I unbelted, took my belt, let the turkey fall, backed away, and the young boy ran right up to the turkey, but he wouldn't take them. 
So Mac Easton, I told him, you may have them, but the kid couldn't understand English. And he said, the more I talked, the more the child became agitated because he wanted something. He wanted the turkey, and I wanted to give him the turkey, and so on. He said, and I began to gesture with my hands for him to take these turkey, and he just kept being agitated. He said, finally, the young boy walk up, walked up to the turkey, he said, and he put out his hands like this. And he waited till I came and gave them the turkey. Then he went off into words. That's the opposite of original sin. Quite simply, God said, I'm going to put you into the garden, into life. That's for all of us. And I'm going to give you life, but you may never take it. You know, I'm going to give you life, but you never, may never take it. Because as soon as you take it, you're not respecting the gift. It's no longer love. You get the difference here? You, you, you can't take it. So, see, it's an, in, it's an intrinsic condition. God couldn't say, well, just go out there and live any way you like. No. We're meant to love each other, but love only works one way. So this becomes the prototype of all sin. This was written centuries after the Ten Commandments, and it's already an attempt to put all the commandments into one. There's only one commandment, and that is that you enter life in a posture of receptivity and not a posture of taking you know, in a world today where so much philosophy is, you know, greed, take it. If you don't take it, nobody's giving it to you. Notice how completely counter that is. You know, you may receive life. You can never take life. You can receive gift. You may never grab gift and so on. That's why I said it's a metaphor for rape. When sexuality is given as an act of love, it's life-giving. When it's done, when it's when it's taken by force of any kind, it's death-dealing. And then you see the consequences are also intrinsic. God didn't say, well, I'm going to punish you. He said, because we do this, because we don't receive gifts, that's why our lives are hard. And that's why we lord it over each other. And that's why men and women don't get along, and so on. And even with the snake, it's a beautiful image. You know, when we stop respecting nature, what happens? That's the ecological mess we're in, you know. Eventually, nature itself suffers and begins to snake bite us. That's all in that story. It's a story of utter genius, you know. That this is, if you want one moral text in the entire Old Testament, um, which, which explains history then, explains history now. What, what's wrong with history now? What's wrong with us? We aren't receiving. <laughs> it's interesting. When Jesus gives us the great Eucharistic words, notice he says, receive. He doesn't say take. Receive, give thanks, break, and share. See, that receptivity is the key to all of love. It's the key to all of morality. You know, as soon as we stop receiving, as soon as the posture isn't this, but it's this, where we're taking, we're doing the original sin. See, it's the prototype of all sin. Okay, now, that's the, the initial story. Then, um, immediately afterwards, then, again, once upon a time. So Adam and Eve have two sons, Cain and Abel. Okay, now this is a great story. They said, Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. One tilled the soil, and the other was a hunter. And they would go to offer gifts. And when Abel would offer his gifts, the smoke would be received up in the sky. And when Cain offered gifts, the smoke wouldn't go up. So Cain became angry and bitter and jealous of his brother. And one day he went out, he took a stone, and he killed his brother. And they said, then his brother's blood just screamed to heaven for vengeance. But God said, no, I'm not going to kill Cain. I'm going to stigmatize him. He's not going to be able to get the bro his brother's blood off of him. And for the rest of his life, People will always look at that and they'll know he killed his brother. And so now he goes through life stigmatized and Abel is dead. Okay. It's a story of falling at the beginning of history. What's that story about? You know, let me put it this way. If you, if you, <laughs> if you ever noticed in scripture, there are 10 commandments and two of them are against what? Jealousy. Notice even sex only gets one. Okay. <laughs> Remember, we have two commands that get jealousy. It's so much that they say from the very beginning, you know what began to haunt the human race 
and make the condition the way it is now? Jealousy. And they said, jealousy is insidious. It works this way. When you read that story, you know you're not Abel. You're Cain. Because they one upon a time, two kids were born. You and your brother or your sister. And your sister was the fair-haired one. She was your mother's favorite. And she never dropped anything. She was never colicky. And she was this beautiful kid. And everybody said, isn't she just the wonder of the world? See, her sacrifice was always accepted. Then you were born. And you were born at an inconvenient time for your mother, and it wasn't a good time in a relationship. And then you were a colicky kid besides, you know. And as a kid, you had eczema and you had other things going. And you didn't do well in school. And, and after a while, uh, this all builds up inside of you. Why isn't your sacrifice going up? We become jealous. We become murderous. And um, we begin to murder each other, but we don't die. What happens, people see it on our skin. They look and say, well, you're a cynical SOB, you know. And we ostracize ourselves. See, these are deep stories. They explain why life is the way it is now. You know, again, analogical, poetic. Let me give you a simple example. You know, today, and we're about 2,000 years in another direction, where we're analytical people. We're not metaphorical people, okay? Remember last week I said, quoting Chester, he says, an atheist is simply another word for a person who can't get metaphor, okay? But see, today we explain things analytically. So I'll give you a very simple example. If you went to a university professor today in the School of Medicine or wherever, and you say, why can't chickens talk or a veterinarian school? Well, they would give you a whole physical thing about a chicken hasn't got a voice box and it hasn't got rational consciousness and so on, and would explain to you why chickens can't talk. If you'd have gone to a man at the time of Jesus or an elder or a woman or the time of these texts written, said, why can't chickens talk? They'd have always begun this way. Once upon a time, they did talk. Okay. <laughs> And then they would construct a beautiful metaphor image of how the chickens fell from that. And since then, chickens can't talk. And you would really understand it in a much different, with a different part of your brain. See, we understand an analysis through the left side of our brain. We understand the other through the right side of the brain, through stories, then a logical metaphor. And these are stories of genius. You know, they say, why is history the way it is now? Say, well, once upon a time, it wasn't. And then they ate the apple. Then Cain killed his brother. And then we had the Tower of Babel. Now, next story. They said, so again, in the beginning. <laughs> in the beginning means before time was the way it is now. Okay, There was a town called Babel. And the people in the town said, let's make a name for ourselves. Let's do something so impressive that the whole world has to admire us. He said, we're going to build an edifice, a tower to heaven. And it's going to be so high and so impressive that everybody simply has to admire us. So they set about building the tower. And then a curious thing happened. As they're trying to build the tower, their languages became confused. And everybody began speaking a different language. And they scattered over the rest of the world. And that's why we speak different languages today. It's been a wonderful story. <laughs> okay. That's not the story of the origin of languages. It's the story of the origin of alienation. You know, why can't we connect with each other precisely, and this is ironic, because precisely we're trying to always build an edifice that's so impressive. You know what this thing is? I want to do something that's so impressive, they have to like me. It's the reason they hate you. You know, it's interesting. Um, in scripture, when they talk about Jesus, and, and at times they say, he's different. He's different than the scribes and Pharisees because he speaks with great power. He speaks and there's authority to his words. Now, it's interesting the word they use. It's in the New Testament. There are three words for authority or power, okay? And two we have in English. One is the word energy. You know, somebody has great energy. Energy is a power. And one is the word dynamic. See, somebody who's dynamic, they're dynamite. Dynamite has power. And they never use those words about Jesus. They never say, my God, he's energetic. This is one dynamic speaker. 
They used the word exousia. And we have no such word in English. E-X-O-U-S-I-A. E-X-O-U-S-I-A. Sorry, I don't have the handout, so. Exousia. And there's no word for it in English, but probably the closest word in English is the word vulnerability. See, he speaks with kind of the opposite of power. He doesn't overpower you, he underpowers you. We don't have a word for it, we have a concept. You know who has exousia? A baby. When you put a baby in the room, ultimately it's the most powerful force in the whole room because they can't overpower anybody. You know, if you put a football player and a rock star and a baby in this room, who has the most power? The baby. See, the baby has exousia. The football player has energy. And the rock star has dynamism. You know, see, but that's the opposite. See, the, the root to community, the root to love, is exousia, is the opposite of building a tower. Uh, it's interesting. Notice the image they say at, at, at Babel, at the Tower of Babel, the tongues scattered and the languages began. But notice in Luke's account of Pentecost, in the Acts of the Apostles, say, the tongues of fire came down and united. You know, in the Holy Spirit, we all speak the same language. And what language does the Holy Spirit speak? So, Scripture tells us there is one universal language. If you speak that, everybody understands each other. It's the language of the Holy Spirit. Well, it's not some vague language. Paul spells it in Galatians. That, you know what the language of the Holy Spirit? Charity, joy, peace, patience, goodness, long-suffering, constancy, mildness, and chastity. You speak that language, they're going to get you. You know, it's interesting, just to give you a, um, an example of this. You know, um, as a priest, I do funerals and I do weddings. And when I was first in seminary, I thought, I'm going to love weddings. I'm going to hate funerals. Uh, it's not true at all. <laughs> okay. You know, the most restless events I go to every year are weddings. And the single most contemplative events you go to every year are funerals. You know why? At a funeral, there's exousia. Nobody has to show off. Nobody has to have hair done better than the next person. Nobody has to stand. You know, it's the opposite. And notice that funeral, you get these people saying, we've got to visit each other more. We've got to stop living like this and so on. At weddings, sometimes if you lit a match, the thing would blow up. You know, there's so much nervous energy and so on. And I can only imagine great gaily events, the Academy Awards and some of them, you know, just the, 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 the restlessness. And, you know, when people are paying $10,000 for gowns and walking on the red carpet and so on, think anybody's very relaxed there? You know, see, that's the Tower of Babel, and it drives us apart. So this story says, you want the key to come together? The key to come together, look at a baby. It'll teach you. How, how communities formed. You, you want to look at, at how to drive yourself apart? Just look at people always trying to impress each other, over-impress them, just, I'm smarter, I'm better, I'm better looking, I get better clothes, I have more money, whatever. Drives us apart. It's the Tower of Babel. Okay, the last one I'll do quickly, Noah and the Ark. You know, they keep looking for that Ark. There wasn't any, you know. <laughs> okay. Actually, the farmers back home, whenever there's a drought, they complained. They always said, you know, when one farmer told me, he said, when the, Noah and the ark, he said, flooded the whole world. He said, our farm got less than a quarter of an inch of rain. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> There's no ark. You understand, that, I'll do this one very quickly. Take Rudyard Kipling's poem, If, and read it beside Noah and the ark, and you got the story of Noah and the ark. If you can keep your head when all about you there are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can stay sane when the world is going insane, that means you've built an ark. You've found a stable point. See, the world is always going to drown you. That's the whole idea of contemplative prayer and everything. You have to find anchors. You have to find a place for your sanity, for your heart to stay mellow and so on. And, and not only that, you have to protect everything that's precious. You've got to take everything that's precious, take two of each and go into the ark, you know. The ark can be your chapel, it can be your prayer place, it can be wherever. See, it's where do you find your ark? Where do you find something that you can float above the insanity and all the chaos of our world? You know, there wasn't any ark, you know. There is one, the same as for us. See, all these stories, they're true stories, not historically true, 
their mythologies, great myths that have been reconstructed to teach about theology, and they say, this is why history is the way it is now, and what we need to learn from it, from Adam and Eve. That's the prototype of all sin. We need to re receptivity. We need to do it with reverence. All sins are sins of irreverence. All sins are sins of not receiving gift properly, of somehow taking it. All sins are sins of rape in some form or another. You know, Cain and Abel, just the way jealousy bites into us and why it does that, and the havoc it wreaks in the Tower of Babel, our, our efforts just to impress. I want to be so impressive that they have to like me. That's why they hate me. Then Noah and the ark. What's your ark? We're, we're in, in today's world and all the stuff. Where do you find a place that's solid, that's God-given, and you, you can rise above it and maintain your sanity? And not only that, you, you maintain and, 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 and protect what's precious in life. It's a powerful story. Okay, now, uh, jumping ahead here. I want to do two stories together here, Old Testament stories. And, uh, and the first is the story of Tobit. Now, I, I picked this story, about many stories I could pick, because this story, in many ways, if you want a story to understand sexual abuse in the church, you can't order one from the catalog or make one up that would fit like this one. This is the story of Tobit. And again, it's an archetypal story. We don't think Tobit was an historical character. And he's telling the story. And it goes this way. Tobit says, I, Tobit, had a great reputation for holiness and righteousness in the community. And one day, I'm sitting down to eat my dinner, and my son comes in and says, Father, there's a dead body in the market squares. Now, in, in Judaism in those days, if you touched the dead body, you were contaminated. So everybody was scared to touch it. And you couldn't eat for some days. So Tobit says, without eating, I got up from the table, went to the market squares, took the body, washed it, dressed it, and buried it. And now he comes home after doing this wonderful virtuous deed, but now he can't eat. He's contaminated. So, so what did I do? He said, I went into the garden to take a sleep. And I lay under a tree, not knowing that there were birds above me. And as I tried to sleep, the droppings of the birds came down into my eyes. Now, this is not very glamorous. He's getting bird shit in his eyes. He said, I felt the burning, and the more I tried to rub it out, the more I rubbed it in, inadvertently. He said, till I went almost blind, and I went to see the doctors, and I spent all my money on the doctors, but they made it worse. In fact, at a point, I went completely blind. And now he's blind, he's home, and he said, my wife, Anna, she used to weave some pieces of cloth for rich people, and one day she wove a particularly fine piece of cloth, and she gave it to a man, and the patron said, I'm giving you your wages, but because the cloth is so fine, I'm also giving you a young kid to take home. So she takes this baby goat, she brings it in the house, and Tobit said, being blind, I heard the goat bleat. So I said to my wife, where did you get this goat? You stole it, surely. He said, no, I didn't. It was given to me in addition to my wages. He said, I don't believe you. Take it back. He said, then my wife's anger flared and she says, yes, you, you, virtuous one. Everybody's known all these years your, your hypocrisy and who you really are. He said, then hearing this from the mouth of my wife, I went out into the garden and I began to weep and I began to pray. And that's the beginning of Tobit's conversion. Now, let's take that story. He has, he's a virtuous man. He's a good man, okay? But he has some major blind spots that he doesn't see. His wife sees them, <laughs> okay? Um, and he's got to hear it from his wife before he knows it. And then something powerfully unglamorous happens to him. The last thing you want happen to you, you know? Uh, and he goes blind, okay? And then in his blindness, his mood deteriorates, and then his wife has to confront him before he begins his conversion. Take the sexual abuse crisis. Take Roman Catholicism, churches in general. You know, we have, and deservedly so, a long historical reputation for doing a lot of really good things. 
but we've also had some blind spots. And, uh, and then what happened to us, the most unglamorous of all things. You know, people who do literature in Dark Nights of the Soul, they say, Dark Nights of the Soul will always hit you where? The very last place you want to be hit. The one Achilles heel, where you say, anything but that, that's what's going to happen to you. <laughs> See, so the Catholic Church, along with, with um, a few of the evangelicals and the Muslims today, were the only people who still fight for chastity and so on. We have a celibate clergy. So where are we going to get hit? The last place with celibacy, with clergy. Okay. And then, like Tobit, we tried to rub it out. <laughs> But the more we rubbed it out, the more we rubbed it in. And then he spent all his money on doctors, we spent all our monies on lawyers, and it didn't help. It made everything worse, okay, until we went completely blind. And then the criticism came. The powerful criticism didn't come from the Boston Globe. It came from within, where people are saying, we're hypocrites. And now we're going to be a much, much better church for that. But that's also true in our own personal lives. Those, those, that's, those are dark nights. The times we get bird shit in our eyes, and you'll know what that metaphor means. That's a metaphor. It's analogical. Okay. <laughs> okay. Not very poetic, but it's analogical. Okay. Um, you know, that leads us to our conversion. He said, then hearing this from my wife, her calling me a hypocrite, he said, then I went outside and I began to weep and I began to pray. Then he comes back a much, much stronger man. Okay, great story. Jonah. Look at the book of Jonah. Okay. <clears throat> it's interesting. When they come to Jesus and they ask for a miracle, and notice Jesus doesn't like doing miracles. Okay. Uh, he, he'll do miracles for compassion, and sometimes he'll do miracles for the sake of revelation, but he'll never do a miracle to prove God's existence. Say, do a miracle. Remember, he always says, an evil and adulterous generation wants a sign, and no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Interesting. What is the sign of Jonah? She says, no miracles except the sign of Jonah. But you can see that, that Jonah fires in about three different ways. But this is the story of Jonah. And again, we don't suspect he was an historical prophet, that this is in the beginning kind of a story. Okay. So they say, Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. And remember this being written for Jews, that they believe prophets listen to God, okay? So, God appears to Jonah and says, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach to the people and tell them if they don't repent in 40 days, I'm going to destroy the city. Now, Jonah has two problems with that. First of all, he doesn't believe it. Secondly, he hates the Ninevites and he wants them destroyed. This, this <laughs> like if he went to San Antonio and said, and they're going to destroy Dallas. See, good. <laughs> no, he hated the Ninevites. So what does Jonah do? Nineveh is to the north. He gets in a ship sailing south, as far away as he can from Nineveh. But God doesn't let him get away with it. So there's a storm at sea. They find out that Jonah has disobeyed God. They pitch him into the ocean. And a whale swallows him up, swims him up to Nineveh, and coughs him up on the shore. You know, so now he's got to do this. Okay, so he goes into Nineveh, and he's half-hearted. He is faithless. He doesn't believe this is going to work. And out of that, he hopes that not. He hopes it's not going to work because he wants them destroyed. So he walks into the city and says, "Repent, or in 40 days, God is going to destroy the city." And you know what happened? Everything happened the exact opposite. They said the people were cut to the marrow. The king got off his throne. The, all the people repented. The king repented. He called the general fast, and he even made the animals fast. The cows and horses got into this. That was the greatest, you know, homily ever preached, you know. And so they all convert. So what happens to Jonah? Is he happy? No. He goes out of the city. He goes into suicidal depression. He tells God, I want to kill myself. You know, he's just had a marvelous success, you know. He said, I want to kill myself because he, he didn't want the invites to convert. And then there's this little teasing text that said, so God had this, this tree grow up that gave him shade, and he thought, God, this is great, you know. And then he was really cheered up for a day, and then a worm came at night and killed the tree. Then he goes back into a suicidal depression again, you know. So God appears to me and says, do you have a right to be depressed? And Jonah said, absolutely, suicidally depressed, you know. God says, why? He said, um, 
Right. He just had a success. He said, I'm God. I would have reason to be depressed. <laughs> he said, I look at all the people in the world and people aren't converting and so on. It's the end of the story of Jonah. Now, a couple of things in there. First of all, you know, prophet's supposed to listen to God. Well, in fact, he doesn't listen to God. So it goes against him. But then it turns out the opposite he, he wanted, and then it goes against his expectations. But let's move to the sign of Jonah. Okay. Jesus said, no sign will be given except the sign of Jonah, which in the New Testament is the resurrection. You know, the, the unexpected miracle, the huge miracle. But here it means that the, the daily miracle, where the king gets off his throne. You know, that, see, Jesus says, don't look so much for miracles of the parting of the Red Sea or, you know, resurrections and stones moving back. But watch for it in this sense. Just when you think it's hopeless, your enemy's going to convert. Just when you think it can never happen, that's when it's going to happen. That the miracles are in everyday life. Karl Rahner, wonderful theologian, someone once said to him, said, uh, do you believe in miracles? He said, no. He said, I rely on them to get through each day. You know, see, miracles isn't necessarily what happens at Fatima or Lourdes or whatever or Guadalupe. Miracles are what happen in your life when your daughter, you know, makes a, the right decision, when this happens. And just when you don't expect, Jesus says, don't expect, you know, rocks moving away from gravestones very often, but expect in daily life. And especially just when you think it's hopeless and when you haven't been faithful, you know, it's not never going to happen because you've been faithful and so on. Maybe you've been <laughs> lazy and wrong and errant and everything else. And just when you think, I don't deserve it and it's all wrong and this person hates me, that's when the person is going to surprise you. See, it's a surprise in everyday life. You know, there's a beautiful uh, New Testament parallel text to that in John's Gospel. <clears throat> you know, when you look at the resurrection miracles, when Jesus appears in the resurrection, this doesn't happen smoothly. You know, sometimes we get the naive thing that Jesus rose on Easter Sunday and they were all on fire and hyped and so on. It didn't work like that. He'd make discreet appearances and then they believed it. You know, and then a day later, did this really happen? And, and they didn't quite believe it. And then they went up and down. And then they go back to fishing at the sea. So at one point, the disciples went back to fishing and see, it was back to their old lives. They abandoned their old lives, you know. And John has a particularly powerful text. He said, one night Peter said, I'm going fishing. And the apostle said, we'll go with you. It's a powerful text that I'm going back to my old way of life. So they went back. That means they're abandoning a dream. Then John said, they fished the whole night and they caught nothing, you know. See, so once you've met Jesus and you turn away, it's not going to work anymore, okay? Then in the morning, just when they spend a night of emptiness, John said they smelled fresh fish across the water, and they looked on the shore, and there was Jesus frying some fish, grilling fish in a fire. John said, nobody had to ask, who are you? They knew he was back. See, just when you give up, the sign of Jonah, just when you give up, you'll smell the fish. See, this is metaphor. Uh, see, and when you read the text literally, you lose all of this. See, fundamentalism of text, it's not so much that it's wrong, it's just it's so impoverishing. Okay, now those are some Old Testament texts. Um, but let me just do a couple of New Testament texts before the, the coffee break. The multiplication of the loaves, which I'm going to link to David and Goliath. And this, this happens in all four Gospels and happens in different ways with different numbers. But we have that miraculous multiplication of the loaves. So let's just take, put them together. They say, Jesus was in a deserted place with his disciples. Okay? And he's preaching for about two or three days, and the people have nothing to eat. So Jesus tells them, first of all, that in one of the accounts, the apostles come to Jesus and said, should we go to town and try to buy some bread for these people? And Jesus says, no, feed them yourselves. They said, well, how can we feed them ourselves? He said, what have we got? He said, we got five loaves and two fish. And one time it's 4,000 people, one time 5,000 people, one time it's 7,000 people. No matter which is three or four or seven, you know, two little loaves of bread and a couple of little fish. 
Jesus says, set it before them. And he says, but what's that before so many? He said, set it before them. He said, and all the people ate as much as they wanted. They had their fill. He said, gather up what's left over. And they, in one text, it's seven baskets. Another, it's 12 baskets of bread that are left over just from the scraps of that little thing. Okay. Now, a couple of things about that text. Today, some people try to explain that text the way, and in, in their very good will, are doing violence to the text. So they said, well, the, what the miracle really was that people had food, and Jesus got them to share the food, and so on. That's a homily, but not a homily for this. Okay. Okay. See, you're supposed to, you're meant, you're supposed to see the hopelessness of the equation. See, it, you, you're meant to see, this is a hopeless equation. You have 7,000 people, you have five loaves of bread and two little fish. How do you feed 5,000 people? Well, it's in the text. And it starts with this. The apostles come to Jesus and they say, should we go into town and try to buy bread for these people? Now, what's wrong with that question? It's really wrong. See, the, the, the apostles want you to, John, particularly, section, he wants you to get some great irony there, which is what? They are talking to the bread of life. <laughs> See, they are speaking to the bread of life. Said, Should we go to town and buy some bread? See, the gospel is saying, hello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you are talking to the bread of life. You don't go away from the bread of life to buy anything. Everything you need is there. It doesn't look like it's there. It's always there. So you have to roll the dice. You have to trust that it's there. So Jesus says, said, and the equation is hopeless, but it works. See, that's the New Testament equivalent to the story we just read a few weeks ago in Scripture and in church of David and Goliath. You know, see, David, little shepherd boy, but he's on God's side. And the Philistines have a giant, Goliath. He just has other soldiers just carrying his iron. That's how big and strong and powerful and armed he is. And so he challenges Israel, the people of God. Nobody can beat this person, you know. So no man can stand up to him. So David, who's a shepherd boy, said, I'll do it. So he goes out with a slingshot, which is a boy's tool. And Goliath ridicules him. He said, am I a dog? that You can be formed with sticks and a little boy's sling. He said, come here, I'll cut your head off. He said, David took his slingshot and a rock, hit him on the forehead, dropped him, killed the giant with his own sword. See, the equation was hopeless. But see, that's the whole thing. We're with the bread of life. When you're with the bread of life, you're with Jesus. Everything you need is there. But historically, and all the time, it's always going to look like you're hopelessly dwarfed. The world is way too big for us to convert. There's way too much stuff going on. We are just these few little people. We're the five loaves, the two fish. <laughs> We're David, you know. But the whole thing is, you always have to trust. We're with the bread of life. Everything we need is there. I'll tell you a great story on this. Um, you know, one of the Gospels, where he does it, and so the next day, the people had a good feeding, and they kind of liked that. So they hustled around the lake where he's going, and they want to be fed again. And they said, Jesus was saddened, Mark said, because they didn't get it about the loaves. Just the way it literally says, they didn't understand about the loaves. I'll tell you a great story. When I was provincial at the Oblates in, in, in Western Canada, um, and one year we always had a congress in August where we get together and you know plan and do visioning and so on and make decisions communally. And so one year, um, and we hadn't asked for it, we discovered actually the government approached us and we found out we owned some land which we didn't know we owned. And we got, I don't know, a quarter of a million dollars or something of this track of land, you know, which we didn't even know we had. So we went to the, 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 P, the, the priests and brothers when they came and said, what should we do with this $250,000? Not we don't have a place to spend it, but it was, it was unasked for and us here, you know. And um, so one of our young priests, a very idealistic priest, stood up and said, you know something? He said, let's give it to the Indians. Not because they needed or asked for it, but we stole the land from them. We should just give it to the Indians. He said, wouldn't that be a gospel gesture? You know, we'd be saying something some kind of atonement, or he said, but not only for them, it would be for us, for us to say, like, we should just give this away. 
Well, about 10 people said, well, that's wonderful, that's idealistic. It's, no, we need the money for missions in Africa and so on. No, no, no. So we put it to a vote, and the poor young man, he lost. Probably, you know, he got about 10 of the votes, and the others got a couple of hundred, you know. And when the ballots were counted and he was defeated, he stood up and he said, this is it. They didn't understand about the loaves. It's a great line. They didn't get it about the loaves, see. That's a text that, in the David, it invites us to roll the dice. They say, don't play safe. You've got to roll the dice on the basis of the gospel. You're with the bread of life. Just give it away. Roll it. You know, uh, security is not what the gospel's about. You know, and, you know, well, how do we do this? We don't have enough and so on. That's what the apostles are telling Jesus. We, <laughs> you got 5,000 people out there. And you want to set this little lunch in front of them? Jesus said, do it, do it. And it was enough, and it's more than enough. Um, some of you were here a few weeks ago when we had Kerry Robinson here from Yale speaking, you know, and uh, wonderful, I mean, kind of a spiritual philanthropy where she says, you know, we always, if you're gospel people, you always have to work with the sense that you're working from abundance. You're not working from scarcity because you're working with the bread of life, you know. I love what this young priest said. They didn't understand about the loaves. He understood it. You know. Now we ended up giving that money to our mission in Africa, which is, you know, so wonderful. But you know, he, he was trying to call us to something higher. He said, let's just do something for the sake of the gospel, just to show we believe it. And it'll be something for us. You know, be something for the natives too. But he said it would be something for us. Just to show we believe the gospel, that the gospel works. Okay, um, I want to do one more. Um, okay. God, I'd love to do this story, but I, but, uh, I will. Then I'll do the Old Testament, uh, New Testament next week. This is another one of these archetypal stories in Scripture, which on the surface makes absolutely no sense. Uh, <laughs> and yet it's a deep, powerful story. It's in Judges Book 11. And it's a story, if you can pronounce that name, Jephthah's daughter, okay. Jephthah was a king. And this is a story. There was a Jewish king, and he goes to war. And things are going badly. He's losing the war. And so what he does, he makes a vow to God. He says, look, if you let me win this war, I will kill at the altar of sacrifice the first person I see when I get back to my kingdom. So God lets him win the war. Then when he gets back to his kingdom, he crosses the border, and he's saddened because the first person he meets is his young daughter, She's just in the bloom of her youth. And he said, well, that's just bad. He said, I promised God I would kill the first person I see, but now it's you, I can't kill you. The daughter says, no, no, uh, we can do this, but there's one thing. She says, there's one thing. She said, there's a condition. She said, now I'm going to die a virgin. I'm going to die non-consummated. She said, so I need 40 days to go into the desert with my maiden companions, and I need, literally, says in Hebrew, to bewail my virginity to bewail the fact that I'm going to die in an unfinished life. So he gives her permission. She goes out to the desert with her maiden companion, and they howl to the moon and do some ritual acts and so on. And then she comes back and dies on the altar of sacrifice. And that's the end of the story. Isn't it just a wonderful story? The word of the Lord, you know. <laughs> it's patriarchal. It's awful. I guess so on. <laughs> if you take it literally... You know, with Old Testament stories, many of the stories, you always put a disclaimer. You know how in the movies they say, no real horses died making this film, you know. <laughs> no real people die in these stories. It's a powerful story. She says, I need to go and I need to mourn because now I'm going to die a virgin. I'm going to die inconsummate. You know, I don't want to die in that state. So if she does, then she's ready to die. This isn't a story about uh, patriarchy or something. It's a story about... All of us, unless we grieve our unfinished lives, we're all going to die in that way. You know, we need to mourn and grieve our unfinished, non-consummate lives, whether you're celibate or married or whatever. You know, as Carl Rahner said, nobody has to finish symphony. And all of us are going to die with just a whole lot of unfinished stuff. And you won't get to finish it. We need to grieve it. Alice Miller, the great Swiss psychologist of the last century, in her 
And this is a, a monumental book. Her book called The Drama of the Gift of Child. The Gift of Child is she says, the second half of our lives have to be given over to grieving, to grieving precisely what, what didn't turn out, to all the things that went wrong and so on. So you can die a very happy person. Um, you can die miserable and angry and still grasping to finish your life. We have to grieve our unfinishedness. You know, when I do retreats with priests and sisters, and I always do a talk on this, and I'll say, you know, because um, we, we take a vow of celibacy. So we're never going to be married. We're never going to have kids. We're going to have sex. I said, do you ever grieve that? Do you ever ritually grieved your celibacy? Do you grieve your virginity? I remember one time uh, one priest said, I don't like that. He said, um, they went to this said, Las Vegas is a desert. He said, I'm going to go out for 40 days and 40 nights. And he says, bewail my virginity before I die. Okay. Okay. No, it's true. See, if we don't grieve it, it's going to snake bite us. Not just the self, it's all of us. It's a powerful story. See, there's no real people die here. Again, it's metaphorical. It's, 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 uh, it's metaphor. It's, it's archetypal. It's saying, you know, we, you, this is at the roots of our soul. See, these, these stories speak to your soul. Uh, and that's also why they put sharp images. You know, after the coffee break, I want to spend the, I want to just tell you one great fairy tale story. When we enter the story, with all stories, um, enter a story, not even so much initially say, what does the story mean? Let a detail grab you, you know, you know. And why is that detail speaking to you? Because that means it's triggering some emotion, and that emotion is triggering some experience you had. That means, and that's your string, that's your lead in into the story, you know. Um, so this story, though, I need to go to the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and bewail my virginity. Well, there's a string to fall, <laughs> you know. Or, uh, you know, like, what, what, always grab like a detail. What, what grabs you here? Because what grabs you, it might not be the most important part of the story, but it'll be something that means you have an emotional trigger there. And that emotional trigger triggers just connected to some experience, which we probably haven't processed, but the story can help us to process and so on. So that's the power of stories. Analytical stuff, which I also teach, has its own power, but sometimes only a story can, can draw it out, can touch that inside of us. Can stories of the Bible arise from actual historical accounts? And if they can, uh, how are the metaphors and the historical accounts connected? It's a very good question. Can, can biblical stories have arisen from historical accounts? Oftentimes they do, particularly uh, not so much at the, you know, at the beginning of Scripture. Those are purely archetypal in the beginning, you know, Noah and the Ark, Adam and Eve. But later on, um, you know, they, they, there would be historical accounts, but then they lay metaphor to it, you know. So I'll give you an example. The, the, the story, the way... Luke, Luke wrote Acts of the Apostles, the way he writes up the Pentecost scene. It's, it's laden with, we don't know what happened there, but the tongues of fire come down and separate and so on. Uh, but, but the way he writes it up, it just, so I'll give you a couple of examples of that. So he says, the tongues of fire came down and they came together and they, they individually went to the people and then the disciples began to speak languages, and everybody heard them speaking in his own language. Now, that's actually a very significant text, you know, that, see, Christianity is a language of translation, where a lot of other religions aren't. So, for instance, a Muslim is not a religion of translation. You've got to read the Koran and the original, you know. Some Christians think that, relig that Catholic, uh, uh, Christianity is a religion like that, and you've got to read it in, in Latin or whatever. No. Notice that after Luke writes up, they didn't say, suddenly we all understand Greek or Hebrew. He said, no, we understand it in our own language. See, so the whole thing is, whatever happened, Luke writes it up that now every language is valid for God's word, for Christianity. There is no privileged language. There is no sacred language. See, everybody hears it in their own language. Um, See, so whatever happened, but the way that you write it up, or, or uh, the conversion of Paul, like always be attention to the details. 
We always said Paul was knocked off his horse and struck blind. Neither of the two are really in the text. <laughs> There's no horse mentioned. But also, he's not necessarily struck blind. He can't see. That's something different. Now, notice what the text says and how rich this text is. It said, then Paul got off the ground with his eyes wide open, seeing nothing. You know, many of us on my ordination day, some of you took vows on your marriage day, eyes wide open, seeing nothing. <laughs> see, he, he didn't know what this was all that cost him. And see, the whole thing, he has to be led by the hand. That's, again, powerful Christianity. See, so Paul, he says to Jesus, I've converted. Tell me what to do. Jesus tells his first lesson in Christianity. It doesn't work like that. He said, now you're going to be led into, the, into, into Damascus by somebody. Somebody else is praying, and then this person is going to come, and he's going to tell you not what to do. He's going to tell you how much you have to suffer for the commitment you just made. You know, See, so the language, th there were historical events that ground this, but then they, they do powerful metaphor and image around that. I'll just give you two examples, but it's just, it's so rich. Uh, or, or the other one, Peter, when they have the miraculous, miraculous catch of fish, they said they started pulling it in the boat, and that may well have happened, said, and that like the boat started to sink. So Peter jumps into the sea, and he, he falls, in, and Jesus says, be merciful for me, forgive me, I'm a sinner. It's interesting, and Jesus immediately says, Peter, you got it all wrong. <laughs> In the face of abundance, that's not the thing. See, the one said, I want you to go out and trust that abundance, not go out and catch people. The way you got this miraculous, that's the way Christianity is going to draw people in and so on. See, so some of these events probably happened historically, and, 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 but they're written up and, and, and they're just laden with metaphor because I'll give you an image for that. See, today... We tend to be literalists. So, for instance, our idea of history is to videotape something. You videotape your daughter's wedding or whatever. See, that's literal. And you got it. But notice artists don't work like that. When an artist paints the Grand Canyon, it doesn't, it's not like a photograph. Because what they do is they distort form to bring out essence. And that's what the, what the, what the four Gospels are. They're not you know, uh, videotape t things of Jesus. They're the story of Jesus, historical, but they take artistic license. And that's why they, it's 4,000 or 7,000, they make different points and so on. But it's an artist distorting form to bring out essence. They say, we're going to show you the essence of Jesus, not necessarily a videotape of his life. Well, are you ready for a story? One, one more question. We what I got this this. Why the sword sharpened? Pardon? Why the serpent? Well, no, the serpent. That's a good question. Why the serpent? It seems to get a raw deal. <laughs> no, but in the story, notice the serpent is cunning and the serpent is the temptress. You know, women tend to get the blame in history, but no, it's the serpent. You know, so the serpent has to get a, get get nailed for that. Uh, See, so on, again, on, on, on the, the, the literal thing, the serpent gets his leg taken off, okay, his legs, you know. But more deeply, that's the thing about the curse is between us and the ecology. You know, today, you know, we are getting global warming and carbon monoxide and so on. That's the serpent in the dust. See, we no longer have a proper relationship to nature, you know, which is a result of the same as... <laughs> We're taking, we're not receiving, we're not doing it reverently, we're not respecting Mother Nature, and uh, so we're cutting the legs off Mother Nature. I'm glad you felt sorry for the, the, the serpent. Okay. One, one last question here, Gary, and then we'll... <clears throat> It's really not a question. <clears throat> I hate to tell you that you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> Again? <laughs> Again. <laughs> you said there was uh, no, there was no ark. Well, in the ancient Irish literature, the <laughs> the um, all the plants and the trees that were destroyed in the flood uh, made their way to Ireland, 
And Noah's three sons arrived in Ireland and they harvested the bogs of Ireland and we continue to do that today in their name. I, I, I absolutely don't doubt that. You know. okay, <laughs> thank you. Well, that's what's in the very old Irish, ancient Irish literature. Okay. So, okay. so our bogs Great. came from Noah. But now I read, need to repay that story with another one. This, this is a story that happened recently in heaven, okay? And, and the Holy Family decided they're coming back to um, Earth for a vacation. And they were de debating where to go. And Joseph said he thought he'd like to go back to Egypt. Since they were just there for the two years, he actually liked it. He made a lot of friends in Cairo. He wanted to see Cairo again. And Jesus said he would like to go to Disneyland since everybody's been to Disneyland except Jesus, you know, he wanted to see it, you know. And Mary said she'd like to go to Knox and she's never been there. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Okay, we're, we're going to have a story, and this is a, okay, sorry about that, okay. I, I know you're a good sport, you know. Actually, I heard the joke told originally about Majagoria, but I thought I'd translate it for you. Okay. Okay. okay, this story, a little apology at the beginning. Uh, this is a long story, it's a great story, and then next week, I'm going to try to bring in Michael Mead, a disc of him drumming a different version of the story, the Eastern European version. This is the Western European version. Of it. It's a very famous story called The Firebird. To my mind, it may be, I think, one of the great fairy tales ever told. Now, it's got about five or six chapters to it, so you have to be patient. Um, and when I was younger, I used to have a lot more courage and nerve to tell stories. <laughs> now, uh, I'm going to try this because you have to get into kind of different modality and so on. And as I said before, hang on to things that strike you, images, phrases, your entry into the story. Then also in stories like this, which are carefully crafted, and I'm going to try to tell it carefully, you know, watch for repetitions, watch for phrases that occur and occur and occur, okay, um, and images. So this is the story. Okay. The Firebird, Western European, okay. Once upon a time, once before a time, once under a time, and once before a time was captured by people and put into clocks. At that time when there was still magic on the planet and God and the angels could walk around here more freely, in that time there was a king. And the king had three sons. And the king lived in a castle, as kings do. And the castle was a huge castle. It had rooms for everything. There were rooms for the king, there were rooms for his sons, there were rooms for visitors, there were rooms for his courtiers, there were rooms for his soldiers, rooms for his horses. There were rooms for eating, rooms for sleeping, and rooms to just sit and look out at the kingdom. And in the center of the king of the, of the castle, there was a courtyard. In the courtyard, there was a garden. And in the center of that garden, there was a tree. There was an apple tree. But it wasn't an ordinary apple tree. It grew golden apples. They were gold and flaming, and their beauty took your breath away. And they weren't apples for eating. They were apples to be looked at, to be admired. And sometimes the king and his son would touch the apples gently and just massage them. And they would look at these apples, but the apples were counted. And every night before he went to, to sleep, the king would carefully count the apples and note in a ledger how many apples there were. And one night when he counted the apples, there was one missing. And the king became very agitated and he immediately called everyone together and his three sons and he said, someone has stolen an apple. And immediately his oldest son came forward and said, Father, I will keep watch. I will keep watch tonight. It's obviously a thief who comes at night and I will keep watch tonight and I swear as your son on oath, no one will ever steal an apple from you again. So that night he took a blanket and he sat by a tree and all night, he sat, and his eyes scanned the horizon back and forth, and nothing happened. And just before dawn, he was overcome with sleep. And his eyelids fell just for several minutes. When he woke up, the dark was just giving way to light. 
And he counted the apples, and there was one missing. And the king was again agitated. And he called his court together and his sons. And the second son came forward, and he said, Father, obviously your older son has failed you. Then give me the permission. I will watch tonight, and I promise you an oath as your son, no apple will ever disappear from your tree again. So he took a blanket, and that night he sat under the tree, and Almighty watched, and his eyes scanned. But his eyes became heavy, and just towards morning, he fell asleep just for a few minutes. When he woke up, another apple was missing. And the father was agitated, and he began to become very upset. He said, somebody is stealing these apples. And then his youngest son, the youngest prince, came forward and said, Father, let me watch. Obviously, my two brothers have failed, but I won't fail. I swear an oath as your son, I will watch, and no apple will disappear tonight. And the father said, no. He said, of all my sons, you're the least reliable, and you're too young. I won't give you the permission. But he begged and pleaded. And finally, the father, but reluctantly, gave him permission to sit by the tree. So he sat with a blanket all night. His eyes were surveying back and forth. And just towards morning, his eyes became very heavy. But in order to stay awake, he took tiny sticks. And he put them into his eyelids that they were impossible to close. And then just as the darkness was giving way to light, he saw a great flame as if a ball of fire, but more gold than fire. And he realized it was the great firebird. And the firebird came and plucked an apple in its mouth. He took his arrow and he shot straight into the breast of the firebird. And a single feather fell to the ground. And the firebird flew off with the apple. And he picked up the feather and he realized that this feather is the most beautiful thing he had ever seen in his whole life. It was flaming gold. It was something he had never seen before in his life. And he realized this feather was truly, truly valuable. And he took it to his father. And they took it to the court. And they examined the feather and its beauty and its worth. And then the king said, I must have the bird. Somebody needs to bring this bird to me. And immediately the oldest son came forward and he said, Father, I will find you the bird. And he was given the blessing. He was given the permission. And he set out on his horse, crossed the drawbridge, through the woods and into the clearing. And he looked down, he saw a small fox. He pulled his bow and arrow to shoot the fox, and the fox spoke. The fox said, sir, don't shoot me. If you don't shoot me, I will give you a counsel. And the son thought to himself, animals don't talk. <laughs> he said, and besides, what could I, a prince, learn from a small creature of the ground? And he released his arrow, but the fox stiffened his tail and disappeared into the woods, and he rode on. And at night, just as the light was giving way to darkness, he entered a small village. And he rode to the center of the village, and to his right there was an inn. And in the inn he saw people dining, he saw people drinking, he, saw, he heard music, he saw dancing, and he was drawn to the light. And to his left he saw an inn of darkness, of quiet. But he was drawn to the inn of dark, of light, and he entered the inn, and he stayed there that night, and in fact he stayed there for a long time after. He never left the inn. And then after a long time or a short time, whatever time it takes for them to realize he's not returning, the second son came forward and told his father, Father, obviously your older son has failed you. Give me the permission, the blessing. And he was given the blessing, and he set out, just as his brother, crossed the drawbridge, through the woods, into the clearing, and there was a fox. And immediately he drew his bow and arrow. The fox spoke. The fox said, sir, don't kill me, and I will give you a counsel. And like his brother, he thought, animals don't talk. <laughs> Besides, what could a creature of the ground ever tell me, a prince? And he released his arrow, but the fox stiffened his tail and disappeared into the woods. And then like his brother, he rode on, and at night, just when darkness, light was giving way to darkness, he entered the village of the two inns, and like his brother, he came to the center of the town, and he saw to his right the inn of light with the dancing, with the music, with the food, with the wine. And to his left he saw the darkness, the quiet of the inn. And like his brother, he was drawn to the inn of light. And he went there and he stayed that night, and he stayed on 
that were left in again. Then after a long time or a short time, whatever time it takes, <laughs> for people to realize that he's not coming back, the youngest son went to the, his father and he says, Father, he said, obviously my two brothers are not returning. Give me the permission. And his father said, no. Of all my sons, you're the least reliable. You're too young. I will not give you the permission. But he begged and pleaded and pointed out to his father that it was him, but got the, seen the fire bird and gotten the feather. So finally, but reluctantly, the father gave him the permission. And like his brothers, he set out, rode out the castle, through the woods, came to the clearing, and he saw a fox. The fox spoke. The fox said, Sir, don't kill me. And if you don't kill me, I will give you a counsel. And like his brothers, he thought, animals don't talk. And besides, what could a creature of the ground teach me? But he thought, even so, maybe he will have some advice. So unlike his five brothers, he didn't shoot an arrow at the fox. He got off. He knelt beside the fox. The fox said, I know what quest you are on, and I can give you guidance. He said, you're to do this. Today, you ride all day, and at night, you will come to a town, and you will ride to the center of the town, and you will stop your horse between two inns, and to the right, you will see an inn full of light and music and dance, and your two brothers, you're not to go into the inn. To the left, you will see an inn, which is dark. You're to go into the inn of darkness. Sleep that night, for you're on a pilgrimage, you're on a quest. He said, and then in the morning, you will get up. And then you need to ride to a distant kingdom. And you can get there. And when you get there, it'll just be nightfall. And you're to wait. There'll be a castle. And there'll be soldiers. And there'll be many rooms. And you're to wait till midnight. And when all the soldiers are fast asleep, and they will not wake when you walk past them, you're to walk through the castle, through every room. And when you get to the very last room, you will open a door. And there will be the firebird the great bird of fire, and its beauty will take your breath away. It'll stop your breath. He said, but the bird will be in a cage made of old sticks and torn pieces of leather. You're to take the cage and the bird and bring it back to your father. But there's one thing. He said, when you turn to leave, you will see behind the door, which you didn't see coming in, a gilded cage of gold and emeralds, which is so beautiful it'll take your breath away. You're not to touch the cage. And the younger son, the prince, thanked the, the fox, and he rode off. The fox stiffened his tail, disappeared into the woods, and he did as his brothers. He rode into the town, but that night he stopped, but he didn't enter the inn of light. He entered the dark inn, and he slept, and he slept peacefully. And in the morning he got up, and he began to ride towards this distant kingdom, not knowing how long it would take, and the fox appeared. The fox says, this is a very distant kingdom. It will take you a long time to get there. So abandon your horse, sit on my back, and I will take you there. So he got on the fox's back. The fox stiffened his tail in no time, or whatever time it takes to get to the end of the world. Uh, they were there. And it was just night. And it was, as the fox said, there was a grand castle and many soldiers. And he waited till midnight when everyone was asleep. And he walked between the soldiers, none of them woke. He walked through the castle, through all the rooms, and finally he got to the room where was the fire bird he opened, and his beauty took his breath away. And the bird was caged in old leathers and uh, sticks, and he picked up the cage to walk back, and his eyes saw the gilded cage, and he took his breath away. And he couldn't resist it. He reached out and he touched the cage and immediately the bird began to be agitated and make great noises. And the soldiers woke up and they came and they grabbed him. They said, because you were arrogant, tried to steal the firebird, tomorrow you'll be brought to, before the king and you will die. And they took him and they threw him into a deep dungeon where we're going to leave him temporarily. <laughs> okay. Okay, you got the story up to now? Okay, that's chapter one. Okay, the other, the other chapters are a little shorter. Okay. <clears throat> but notice some of the repetitions. A little long time, short time, whatever time, and all this fox stiffening his tail and so on. Um, and just think, what the image of the firebird 
And notice in this story, you'll only know at the end, no femininity has appeared yet. Notice there was a king, he had sons, what about daughters, what about a queen, and so on. They're not there yet, you know, okay. Now, let's go back. He's in a deep dungeon. He's going to die. So in the morning, they bring him before the king. And the king said, because you tried to steal the firebird, you will die. And you will die now. He said, my sword will find the space between your neck and your shoulders. But there's one way you can save your life. He said, there exists in this world, in a distant kingdom, something that is more awesome than the bird of fire. And that is the black horse of power. There exists a horse whose power is so great that it, it's, it's the greatest thing on this planet. He said, if you could bring me the horse of power, I will give you the firebird and the gilded cage. He said, but if you don't, you will die. So now choose. So of course he chose to save his life. He leaves the castle, but now he's dejected. There are tears in his eyes. He's walking on the road aimlessly, not knowing where to go when he sees the fox. And he's overjoyed to see the fox, and he sits down and he tells the fox immediately what happened. And the fox didn't exactly offer sympathy. The fox said, I told you not to touch the cage. He said, but because you didn't try to kill me, not all is lost. He said, I'll give you another counsel. He said, you can, ha you can find the horse of power, and you can bring it back, and I will show you how. He said, you're to travel now to a further kingdom that's more distant than this kingdom. And you will get there at night, and there'll be a castle, a larger castle than this one. There'll be more soldiers, and you're to wait to the middle of the night. And then when everyone's asleep, you are to walk through the castle, and beside it, at the end of the castle, there's a stable, and inside of there will be the great horse of power. He said, but he'll be tied up with a bridle made of sticks and old leathers. You're to take the horse of power and bring him back to this king. He said, but there's one thing. He says, um, when you turn to leave, you will see a bridle whose beauty is not such as you have never seen. You're not to touch the bridle. And then he said, because the kingdom's distant, he said, get on my back and I will take you there. And he sat on the horse's, uh, the fox's back. The fox stiffened his tail and then in a long time or a short time, whatever time it takes to get to the far, far kingdom, they were there and it was night, and he waited till the middle of the night. And he went through the castle as the fox had directed, with the soldiers, none of them waking as he walked past them, and he opened the door of the stable, and there stood the horse, and its beauty stopped his breath. It was more beautiful than anything and more powerful he had ever seen in his life. But he was tethered with an old bridle of sticks and, uh, and old leather, and he untied the horse, he began to lead it out, and he saw the gilded bridle, and his beauty took his breath away. But he realized he should obey the fox, and he knew what had happened last time. But just as he was leaving, he thought, you know, a horse that's this beautiful shouldn't have a bridle made of old sticks and stuff. It deserves this bridle, and he reached out and he touched the bridle. The horse began to become very agitated, woke all the guards, they came, they took him and they said, um, because you tried to steal this, the horse of power, you'll be brought to the king tomorrow, and tomorrow you'll die. And they threw him into a deeper dungeon than before. Okay. You're all good so far? Okay. Okay, chapter three. So, then after a long time or a short time, whatever time it takes, you know, before you're brought before a king to be executed, they bring him before the king and the king was upset. The king was angry. The king was murderous. The king said, because you had the arrogance to try to steal this horse, you will die, and you'll die now. And my sword will find the space between your neck and your, uh, and your head. He said, but there's one thing. You can save yourself. He said, there's one thing on this whole earth, and it's at the end of the earth, that's more valuable than the horse of power, and that is the beautiful princess. If you would go to this kingdom and bring back this beautiful princess, I will give you the horse of power, and I will give you the gilded bridle. He said, but if you don't, you will die, and it will be my sword that kills you. Choose. So, of course, he chose to live, but now he comes out, and again, he's disoriented. He's wandering aimlessly. 
There's tears in his eyes. He realized he should have listened to the fox. And as he's looking down, he sees the fox. And he tells the fox what happened. And again, the fox didn't offer sympathy. He always said, I told you not to touch the bride all. He said, but not all is lost. Because you didn't try to kill me, I'll give you yet another counsel. I know where is the princess. I can take you to the princess. And the princess will agree to come with you. She will come willingly. But it's at the furthest kingdom on the planet. Said, and when you get there, there will be soldiers and there will be guards. But if you wait, just at midnight, in the moonlight, the princess comes out to take her bath, to bathe in the moonlight. You're to wait. And when she comes to take her bath, you're to go forward and kiss her. And then she'll come willingly with you. But there's one thing. Okay. She'll want to go back to kiss her mother and father good goodbye, but you can't allow that. So he thanks the fox. And the fox said, it takes a long time to get to the furthest place on earth. He said, go on my back. And the fox stiffened his tail. And then whatever time it takes to get to the end of the earth. They were there. The furthest kingdom on this whole planet. And he waited till midnight when a beautiful moon and the princess came out. And her beauty was such as he had never seen. And um, she began to this robe to take her bath. And he went forward and he kissed her, and she immediately said, I'll go with you. She said, I'll go with you wherever you go, but just one thing. She said, I need to go back and kiss my mother and father goodbye. She said, because it's not right. I'm going away for a long time, perhaps forever. It's not right that I should go without kissing my mother and father goodbye. She said, no, it's not allowed. It cannot be. She said, why can't it be? This would be cruel. This would be heartless. It can't be. And then she began to cry. And he was moved by her tears. He said, okay, go. He said, but do it quickly and try not to wake them. Okay. <laughs> I think you know where this is going. Okay. So the princess goes back in to her mother and father's bedroom. She goes by the father's side, kisses him. He doesn't wake. She comes to the mother's side, kisses the mother, and the mother wakes and immediately she intuits. She intuits everything. She grabs her, she holds her, wakes the father. They wake the soldiers. They go and find the young prince. They say to him, nobody has ever had such arrogance before. And tomorrow you'll be brought to the king, and tomorrow you will die. And they throw him into yet a deeper dungeon than he's ever been in before. And they leave him there, telling him that tomorrow you will die. Okay. Now he's in dungeon three already. Okay. You know, usually when you're with the group, these are good times to stop and discuss and so on, but we don't have enough time to get the story finished tonight. Okay. So let's pick him up again. He's in a dungeon. So after a long time or a short time, or whatever time it takes, then, okay, <laughs> they bring him before the king. And the king said, because you were arrogant to try to steal my daughter, you will die. And you will die now. And my sword will find the space between your shoulders and your head. He said, but there's one thing you can do. You can save your life. He said, my daughter must indeed marry somebody, but it must be somebody who's worthy. It must be somebody who's like a god. And so I offer you this. There's a mountain one mile from here. He said, I'm going to give you eight days. If you can move that mountain in eight days, I will give you my daughter gladly. He said, so now choose. So of course he chose to save his life. So he left, and immediately... He went to the village and he bought shovels and wheelbarrows and all kinds of axes and picks and ox carts. And for the next seven days and seven nights, he worked and worked at this mountain. And when he got to the night of the seventh day, he saw that he hadn't even made a dent. All he, you couldn't even see what he had done. And he realized this is truly over. And as he sat down and realizing his life was now over, he saw the fox. And he explained to the fox, and the fox said, I told you not to let her go back. <laughs> he said, but now, because you didn't try to kill me, I'll give you one last counsel. I said, just sleep. You are very tired, fall asleep, and we'll see what the morrow will bring. And he fell asleep, and he slept peacefully, and he woke up, and the mountain was gone. And the king was overjoyed, and the king said, you truly are a man who's worthy of my daughter. He said, I give you my daughter. I give you my daughter's hand. Take her back to your father, and you may marry my daughter. She will be your queen. And they're overjoyed, and they're walking back, and they see the fox. And the fox says to them, well, he said, there's a new plan now. 
He said, uh, this is the plan. He says, the princess is for you. He said, but so is the horse of power and so is the bird of fire. He said, so what you do is this. You go, go back to the king who asked for the horse of power and pretend you're going to exchange the daughter for her. And as they line up and they bring out the horse of power, put the, put the princess last. And as you give her an embrace and shake her hand, take her on the horse and you will ride away and because the horse of power, no one will catch you. He said, and then you come to the kingdom of the firebird and there's one hour every day where the firebird is put into the golden cage and it's brought out and it's shown to the people. You're to sweep down with the horse of power and to grab the golden cage and the firebird and then take them both back to your father. They like that plan. <laughs> okay. But he said, now there's one last thing. He said, um, I've done many things for you and it's now time that you go on your own, that you won't always see me. He said, but I'm asking you to do this now. I'm asking you to take your arrow, your bow and arrow, and shoot me. Kill me, and then I want you to cut off my paws and keep them in your pockets. And the prince said, we can't do that. What kind of gratitude would this be? And the fox said, no, you don't understand it, but you really need to do this. He said, I can't do it. The fox said, well, then I'll give you one last counsel. He says, don't go near gallows, and don't ever sit on the edge of a well. And he stiffened his tail and disappeared. And now both the prince and princess thought, this is weird. And he thought, you know, the fox, he was good for a while, but these, these last commands, this is pretty weird. And they talked about this among themselves, but they this the fox instructed. They went back as if to exchange for the horse of power, and the horse of power was brought with the gilded bridle, and as he's saying goodbye, he uh, grabbed the princess, they rode off, they swept down in the village and grabbed the bird of fire in its golden cage, and now they're riding back to the castle and they have everything. And their last night they came to the town of the two ends. And just as they got there, it was morning, they saw there was some commotion on the town square. They stopped and asked, what's happening? And they said, um, there's to be a hanging. Two men rode into this town a long time ago, and they're bad men, and now they're to be hung. And he recognized the two men as his brothers. So, feeling very gracious, he went to the mayor and said, whatever the cost is, uh, if you spare my brothers, and they agreed on a price, and the mayor released the brothers, and now the brothers saddle horses, and they're all riding back to the castle, and there's great joy, and he keeps telling his brothers this story about meeting this fox, and how this fox gave him this, this wonderful instruction, and how he got the firebird, and then the princes, and the horse of power, and the brothers kept saying, indeed, indeed. And finally they get to a clearing, and they're tired, and they stop, and there's an old well, and his brother said, why don't you sit on the edge of this well and tell us that story again? As he sits on the edge of the well, they run up and they flip him into the well. And as he's falling this deep, deep down to the well, he hears his brothers laughing. And he realizes that he will die in the well. They will take the princess and the horse and they will go to their, to their father and he will die in the well. So he's in the bottom of the well. He hears them go off. And he realizes there's no way of getting out. The well was dry, full of leaves but deeper than any of the dungeons he had been in. And as he looks down, he sees the fox. And the fox said, um, I told you okay, <laughs> to stay away from gallows. <laughs> and I told you not to sit at the edge of a well, but because you didn't try to kill me, he said, hang on to my tail. And the fox stiffened his tail and pulled him out of the well. And he said, but now there's a new situation. He said, your brothers have turned your father against you. Your brothers have lied. Your oldest brother is to marry the princess. The wedding feast is being prepared even now. And they have to send out lookout. Should you come close to the castle, the soldiers will kill you. He said, so this is my new counsel. He said, when you get to the edge of the woods before the castle, there'll be a beggar. And you're to exchange clothing with the beggar. And you put on his beggar clothing and you give him your royal clothing 
and they will not recognize you. You can walk straight into the castle where the feast is. They will take you for a beggar. And he said, and then see what happens. So he did this. He exchanged clothes with the beggar. And as the feast was being prepared and the musical instruments were strumming up for the wedding, he walks right into the center of this and nobody recognizes him except the princess. And the princess had grown strangely silent and solemn since Stalin, since she had come to the castle, she had said nothing. And the firebird refused to sing and the horse of power refused to eat. And when the princess saw him, she gathered her courage and she went to the king and told him what had happened. And the horse of power let out a magnificent sound that could echo right through the kingdom and the bird, firebird began to sing. And then the king believed the younger prince. And then he said, there'll be a wedding, but this young prince is gonna marry the princess. And then they had a magnificent wedding celebration for three whole days. He married the princess and now that all the wealth of the firebird, the horse of power, his father's blessing, and they married, and they lived happily ever after? No, that's not the way the story. So they married and they lived happily for a while. They lived happily with the beauty of the bird, with the power of the horse, with the power of their love for each other, with the prince's great beauty. But strangely, there was, they always felt there was a happiness that was escaping them. There was a melancholy they couldn't explain. There was a restlessness that they couldn't fathom. And one day, the prince, walking in that manner, as men walk when they're trying to ponder something they can't ponder, when me how men walk when they're pondering why they're unhappy and they can't explain why. And he's looking down in that way and he saw the fox. And he was overjoyed. And he bent down. And he told the fox, I I'm not happy, I have everything, but I'm there's something missing. And the fox said, I can tell you what's missing. He said, remember a long time ago, I asked you to do something for me. I asked you to kill me and to carry my paws with you. And he said, I can't do it. And the fox said, you must do it. Then, in great sorrow, costing everything to himself, he raised his arrow and he shot it straight into the heart of the fox. The fox began to writhe on the ground and uh, in great pain and agony. And as it was writhing, suddenly it began to transform into something. And it transformed into a young man who, was, who had a wonderful countenance. You couldn't even call it handsome. It was just, there was something wonderfully in, in this young man and his bearing. And the young man looked at him and the prince said, who are you? Who are you? He said, well, I'm the prince's brother. I'm the brother of the princess and I'm your brother too. He said, take my hand. And he led the, 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 the young man to the princess. And he says, I'm bringing you my brother. And she recognized him and she embraced him. And she said, he will live with us. And then he moved into the castle. And then afterwards, strangely, they lived happily ever after. It's the story, folks. <laughs> There's lots of elements to it. I'm going to bring you a sheet next week in which I'm going to, you know, like, what's the symbol of the firebird? What's the symbol of the black horse of beauty? Why does femininity only appear late? And notice where femininity appears at the edges of the world, at the furthest kingdom, and so on. Um, you know, th there's different versions of the story. You know, sometimes I've heard the story told where it's three princesses the same story, but the oldest princess, youngest prince, and so on, um, you know, and, 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 and it's a queen, and there's no masculinity because she finds the prince, you know. I wish I had an hour just to, to digest some of the story with you. Um, this story has been around for some thousands of years. There, there's a lot in this story, you know. Next week, I'm going to have Michael Mead, if I can set up the technology, because <laughs> I have this on a cassette tape, and we have to find a way of playing a cassette tape through the system. But Michael Mead, who's also a drummer and a professional storyteller, who can tell that 
he's going to tell the, the Russian version of this with great gusto, in which you see the firebird, the princes, and the black horse of power have slightly different roles, but in the end will be basically the same story. Uh, but just, who's the fox? It's God, you know? Uh, and notice, you know, at the end, I mean, just to give away some of the stuff, like, you know, they can't be happy until this third person is living with them, you know? And also, like, in its own way, the Paschal mystery that somehow the Christ has to be killed, or even in Buddha, if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him, and so on. Um, but, but also, it would be good to go, go ask yourself, like, why, do, why does he consistently not obey the fox? What, you know? And notice there's a little progression. The first time, it's just he can't help himself. The second time, it's a rationalization for the horse. The third time, it's sympathy, you know. And the fourth time is, how can I kill you when you've done all this for me? And so on. And then you see there's an inflation as he gets rich. Fox, not that smart, you know, and so on. Um, but, but anyway, just digest the story. I'm sorry, I'm not a professional storyteller, but, uh, <laughs> but that's it. Uh,